family with Mr. Neil Berkeley and Mr. Wayne White and Miss Mimi Pond. I'm Morgan and you are watching the Og Hero Network. Thank you so much for talking with me today and welcome to Nashville. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. And I just think the beauty is embarrassing. It's an amazing film. It's inspiring. And it's just a good documentary. Thank you. Mr. Berkeley, what was the moment you said, I have to do this? <laughs> Pro probably uh, when I met Wayne. I, he was always an inspiration to me as a kid. Uh, anyone my age watched the work he did with Pee Wee's Playhouse and Bigman's World and the music videos and, and everything. And I always knew that he was uh, the person he was, that he was, in, was inspiring, was interesting and funny. And I knew there was a good story, so I wanted, I wanted to do this for a long time. And I was actually worried someone else would do it. But luckily, they didn't, and I got to I got to make this movie. <laughs> now you do this. You do art a lot. Yes, I am an artist. Yes. Now in the video, it shows clips of your art, like the clay. I mean, like the puppets. Mm -hmm. What's the favorite piece of art you make? Is it the um, drawing, like just sketching the sets or the puppets? I don't have any favorite thing. That's why I do so many things, because I love them all equally. I love to make paintings. I like to draw. I used to draw comics. Uh, I love making puppets. I love making sculpture, three-dimensional things. Uh, my career is all about just uh, doing many different things. Tell me a little bit about Beauty is Embarrassing. Explain the title and the message you hope viewers will leave with. Well, the title was originally in one of my paintings because I make paintings with words in them. And I came up with this phrase, beauty is embarrassing, because it's, it means several different things. But I think the core meaning of it is, is that when we see something beautiful, we're in awe of it. We, we feel humble. We're not worthy. You know, it's like we feel like uh, in, we, we're uh, intimidated. You know, it's like, I wish I could be that beautiful. Oh, it's like, oh. We're, it's, a, it's a very uh, vulnerable way to, to feel when you see something all overwhelmingly beautiful. And when you're feeling vulnerable like that, it's an embarrassing kind of situation. You know, your emotions come to the, come to the surface and it's a little uh, embarrassing to, to be in that kind of shaky state. So in that, in, the, that, in that sense, true beauty is humbling and embarrassing. So that's really the the main meaning I take from it. That's amazing. Thank you. I love it and I think everyone else will too, but congratulations on the award you won at the Cleveland International Film Festival. Thank you. How happy were you when you got that? <laughs> <laughs> How happy were we? Dude, ecstatic. It was, it was amazing. That was a great festival. That was a great crowd. And of course to be, you know, recognized and rewarded for your work is, is always a, a special thing. To have that in front of 2,000 people, was uh, that was a very special moment. I have to add that um, just like uh, a lot of people are lulled into the idea that when they see uh, something on TV or at the movies that the actors are kind of making it up as they go along, um, I think a lot of people just sort of have the idea because Wayne is the, the star of the film and the subject of the film that somehow it means he made it, and when in fact Neil is the one who's responsible yes. for making this amazing film and yes. deserves all the credit. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Neil, I mean, it's about me as an artist, but Neil made an, a piece of art about me, so it's a double. It's like about right. art making, but the movie is a piece <laughs> of art too by Neil Berkeley. And my wife, of course, is a great artist. She's a cartoonist and should be an inspiration for all young women everywhere. Right, Mimi? Right. Absolutely. <laughs> if you don't mind, I would like to go back a bit. What would you? What did you like to do when you were a kid? Like, what games? Go ahead, Mimi. Um, me first? Yes. <laughs> first? Um, well, of course, I always loved to draw. And <clears throat> I like to build dioramas. And, um, you know, set up little scenarios, and uh, I love to read, I love to ride bikes, I liked horses. Um, I didn't really get a big chance to indulge my 
love of horseback riding because my parents didn't have a lot of money and and um, you know it's 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 you know horses are a money pit so <laughs> that was out but um, mostly just drawing and and uh, riding bikes I also found as I got older that uh, and I could take a bus around wherever I, I went I would take a sketchbook with me and I was always drawing um, so I think not having a car and not driving for a long time was an advantage for me um, as a young person because you know I had to sit and wait for buses and that would like force me to really be aware of my surroundings and it's a way of looking at the world you know I mean now everyone's like on their phones all day long and I'm, I'm just as guilty but if you put the phone down and you just start you know watching you know, I notice things other people don't because I'm trained to just see it as part of my entertainment. It's like, you know, what are people like? You know, who's that person over there? What's that? Uh, why is that person wearing that funny hat? You know, <clears throat> it's it's a part of what makes you who you are is is observing the world and taking it all in. So that's my answer. Well, I liked to draw as a kid. That was my number one favorite thing, and that's why I'm an artist now. I liked playing baseball. I loved playing with uh, my Fort Apache uh, Cowboys and Indian sets. I love little action figures and, and toy soldiers. Uh, I loved riding my bike trip too. I loved uh, just running, run, running around in the woods. I lived in the country, so I loved the woods and the outdoors and fishing in the creek and all that stuff. You know, all that fun stuff. How about you, Neil? Yeah, I, mean, I did, you know, sports, rode the bike around, did all of that. I actually started riding at a very young age. I was one of the kids that, you know, the, the teachers hopefully find out who can do what. And I was one of the kids that they pushed to write. Um, I was always in the, on the newspaper and the yearbook and always doing those kinds of things. And even, you know, I, all through college and everything, always pushed to write short stories and essays and scripts and things like that. So I would do that for fun when I was young. And I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was a kid. That was the first kind of artist I wanted to be because I loved comic books and Mad Magazine and cartoons. And that was my first idea as an artist. And I was a cartoonist for a while. That's how I met my wife, Mimi, who's a cartoonist. My dad was an amateur cartoonist and he taught me how to draw. So I always wanted to be a cartoonist even though there were hardly any women cartoonists then. Uh, thankfully, my parents were always very encouraging of my work and no one tried to say, but there aren't any women cartoonists. <laughs> Which is a problem with a lot of young women is trying to, or young people in general, is if you're born into circumstances where you're not exposed to art or you're not exposed to that thing that you aspire to, you can't even imagine yourself as entering that world. But, um, you know, with Wayne and I both came from that kind of circumstance where we didn't know anyone who... We didn't know any grown-up artists. And I think it's great for young people to meet professionals and people who are doing kind of dream jobs. Cause Just to it, know it, that it, it's possible. That it, it really is a real thing and that can inspire young people, I think, to meet professionals when they're young. And not just, you know, your mom and dad, but, you know, lots of different people. Who was your role model? Who inspired you? Like, made you who you are today? Like, who really made you want to be this? Well, my mother was an early inspiration for me because she loved decorating and she loved antiques. And she would take me to antique stores and junk stores and all kinds of interesting places that had all kinds of interesting objects. And um, so that, that was my earliest inspiration was my mother. My first grade teacher was a big influence on me. She told the whole class I was going to be an artist one day. Even though I sort of knew I was an artist, it just kind of made it real when she told the whole class, and that changed my life in a significant way. And um, those were my two earliest influences as a, as a kid. And, um, and then just, like I said, reading uh, comic books and Mad Magazine was a big influence on me, because I, I could, um, dream about drawing cartoons by reading those books? Um, well, I have to say the same. My father was, he, he worked a blue collar job, but he always was doing cartoons and sculpture and stuff. So 
um, it was meant a lot to have him around and be very encouraging to me about my work. Um, I also loved comics. I loved Peanuts. I loved um, Mad Magazine, but also um, the book Harry the Spy uh, by Louise Fitzhugh, who also illustrated the book, was a real mind blower because number one, it was about a girl who noticed things and wrote them down and kept a notebook, and uh, the drawings were just absolutely fantastic. And uh, another great author is Beverly Cleary, who wrote, you know, Ramona and Beezus and Ramona and that whole series. Um, those are just, I think, the most wonderful children's books ever. Yeah, I'm gonna say my, my parents as well. Uh, my my mother had an incredible work ethic and drive and energy, and I saw that and learned from that. I think that's I see a lot of my uh, how I am now comes from that. Just having this drive to do things and get things done and get a lot of things done. And they're my both my parents are very funny. They're very funny people. They very dry, very sarcastic. And my dad's a great storyteller, and I think I learned that from him. Like I love to hear and tell great stories, which is kind of what, what I've done here, or tried to do. Um, and I, I know that's definitely where I got that, because he, he can spin yarns forever, and he's really good at it, and tells a great, funny story. So, uh, definitely my parents, probably, they're, they're the biggest influence on me. That was my influence. Oh. <laughs> How would you finish a sentence when you were a kid? When I grow up, I want to be... An artist. An artist. A baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my brothers want to be. <laughs> Sorry about that, Neil. <laughs> still, I'm still trying. <laughs> you have a good career going on. Yeah, I'm doing okay. When was that moment you said, aha, this is what I want to do? Well, you said as a kid, like, you were always going to be an artist. Yes, I always knew. and But I, like I said, that aha moment for me was when my first grade teacher told the whole class. And that kind of... For some reason, that just made it very real. Even though I knew I was going to, but that that was the uh, that was the guarantee that it was going to happen in my mind. So that was my aha moment when my first grade teacher told the whole class on the first day of school. I I don't know if there was a big aha moment. It was always just what you know. It was always what I was going to do, um, and I think. You know, as I as I grew up, people would say, "Well, you know, good. You can grow up and illustrate children's books." And I was like, "No, it's not what I want to do." I mean, I think sometimes people, especially with girls, that like they kind of project on you what they think you should do. You should grow up and be a teacher. Well, they and, do that with like, everybody, not yeah, just girls. Well, that's true, but. Um, there was a time when I thought, oh, maybe I should illustrate children's books, and I kept thinking, that's not really what I want to do. I love children's books, but that's not what I want to do. And I think the important thing is to, you know, ignore what other people think you ought to do and just remember who you are inside and, you know, just keep going no matter what. I mean, I think if you have it in you, you know, burning that knowledge of who you are and what you ought to be doing, you have to do it no matter what. Yeah, but I'm the same way. I, I never really knew exactly what I wanted to do, and actually, I it was that was actually a problem for me, is I didn't have enough focus to try and figure out what I wanted to do. But I knew what I didn't want to do. I, I knew I didn't want to have. I saw how hard my dad worked, and I knew I didn't want to break my back every day working like that. And I saw how many jobs my mother had, and I knew I didn't want to live a life like that. So I knew I wanted to be on my own and have my own thing and do my own work. But figuring out what that was took a while. But uh, that's that is important. I, I think we can do. It's getting better. Like you're doing this, and that's amazing. You're doing this on your own. Like I never would have thought to do something like this as a kid. But we should tell kids that you can do not whatever you want to do, but you can build a life. And it's not all about going to high school and then college and then get a job and then have you know do this thing. Um, you can have a life that you want. Um, and obviously you're trying to do that, yes. so it's good for you. Thank you. Miss Pond and Mr. Berkeley, that message you just sent to the kids and the adults watching is very good and important to us. Huh. Now that you are role models, how do you hope to inspire others? Well, I, this movie is, is um, 
um, obviously inspiring a lot of people because many, many people have, we've shown it now in five different cities at, uh, at film festivals and nearly everybody says they're inspired by it. So uh, I'm happy that this my, the story of my life is inspiring people. And that story is to never give up and keep dreaming and do what you love and try to find your own voice. I would say basically the same thing. It's, it's really, uh, you know, remembering, you know, at your core who you are inside and what you want to do and, and doing it in the best way possible and never giving up. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it, it's, I don't have a, a specific message or thing I want to tell people. I just want to live a life that I want people to find appealing and exciting, you know. I want kids to look at me and just see what I do and how I act and how I live my life and hopefully it's in a way that, that they'll respond to and want to, want to be. Well, it's also, you know, it's just about the uh, courage to find your own voice, to listen to yourself. Don't don't be un, don't be crazy about it, but always keep always keep the sense that I have the freedom to listen to myself and, and understand myself. And, and the the knowledge to know that that you do have a voice and it is worth hearing. And your job is then to make it as a, you know the best voice you can. You know, not just a bunch of gobbledygook, but let's you know. Let's keep working on it and working on it and honing it until it's it's the best talent that you can bring to the world. Now, in in reaching out to today's youth, if you could get advice to the youth today, what would it be, and like, why would you say that to them? Put down your video games. Yes. Go outside. Walk around. Notice things. Watch other people. Watch human interaction. You know, paint, paint a landscape, uh, draw a tree. Yeah, do old-fashioned things. Yep, definitely put down the phones and the video games and go out in nature. Or just outside in your city and walk around and, you know, notice the world. Learn financial responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. that. that's, that's, no one taught me how to do that. That's my advice. Become financially responsible and take care of your money. I think that's going to be And be nice to your mom and daddy. Yeah. <laughs> if you could change one thing in the world, only one, what would it be and why would you change it? Oh, wow. Big question. Wow. <laughs> How long is this show? No, no, don't have to ask us questions like no. that. We have all of the page left. <laughs> no, I mean, we could be here a while. The one thing to change in the world. I think more tolerance mm -hmm. for other people's ideas. I mean, I think the great thing about tolerance is it, it doesn't mean you have to like someone, it just means you have to put up with them. Or you just have to say, okay, you're doing your thing, I'm doing my thing. Like, you know, uh, different religions, lighten up. Let people believe what they want to believe. It's not hurting you. Uh, you know, someone's a different color, it's not your problem. They got their own life to live, who cares? There's more important things to worry about in life than, uh, you know, what other people think. I agree with that. I think that's the greatest thing about this country, is it's, it's not about uh, that everyone has to believe the same thing, that it's about that everyone can believe different things and it's still okay. I, that's, that, I would agree, I agree with that. Can I, I have one more thing for, if I could tell kids what to do? Yes. Um, my favorite quality in a person is curiosity. I would tell any kid to become curious. That's good. Start That's very good. asking questions, start meeting people, get out and see the world, look at things and, and try to have a, you know, react to them and learn about them. Curiosity is a wonderful, wonderful And don't attribute. be afraid to ask questions. Yes. Don't be afraid yeah. of, of seeming stupid. And don't be so shy all the time. I, I know it's, it's scary and, and shyness is kind of a way to hide, but get over your shyness. That's very good advice. If you could thank just one person, only one person in your life for making the biggest difference, who would it be in mine? Well, I guess I'd have to say my mother. Um, you know, everyone's got a mother who's uh, 
threatened to jerk them bald headed if they didn't do the right thing. So <laughs> I think um, just uh, knowing, you know, having having a you know strong maternal influence of someone who not only uh, has taught you how to, to behave well in society, but how to take care of yourself. I mean, I think. Um, the thing about growing up and being on your own for the first time is um, one of the things that saved me was just um, remembering that I had to, when I was completely alone in a strange city trying to, to get by, was I kind of had to become mother to myself. You know, I had to, to treat myself well and cook myself meals and tuck myself in at night. And that makes a big difference, you know, just. Um, you know, if, if your mother isn't there for you, then you have to, you know, sort of turn to your inner mom. Yeah, I agree. All my parents, you know, I think they're, they're the biggest influence on me, definitely. Um, you know, but I think that's true of any kid. It all begins at home with your parents. And your teachers are important too, but uh, unfortunately I didn't have a lot of great teachers. <laughs> but I had a few. But uh, consistently, my home life was, you know, where it all begins. <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree. You know, my, my parents are definitely, uh, they're, they're doing things every day to help a lot. We, I have a big family, and they're always helping people and helping the family. There is a guy in my, in my life that is a great example, my Uncle Paul, and he's lived in the same neighborhood his entire life. And he's become very, very important to that neighborhood because... It's, he's a great example of a guy who just ha loves this place, these streets, and the people on those streets. And he's become the, the mayor of that little piece of Boston where he lives. And I think he's a great example of someone. They've painted him on walls, and his name is all over the city. But he's never donated money. He's never done anything like that. Never done grandiose or look at me. He just does this thing every day where he protects this neighborhood and protects the people in it. And he's become so important to this little bitty colony of people and it, that's always been fascinating to me how he's done that and become this guy that they all love and respect and need in their lives. My, so my Uncle Paul, he's a great guy. And I, I just would have to add if, if there's kids out there who, who are <clears throat> unfortunate enough not to have parents who are there for them, um, I think it's important to find for everyone whether, whether you do have good parents or whether you don't. Uh, as you as you go out in the world to find people who are going to be supportive of what you want to do and build a support system around yourself of people who are going to tell you that your dreams and aspirations are worth going for. In other words, surrounding yourself with positive people rather than with with negative people who say, you know, oh, you know, you, you, you'll want to give up on that dream. That's not going to work out for you. Um, get rid of those people in your life. You know, get gather the people around you who are going to tell you what you are doing is a good thing and that you should keep doing it. Are you guys parents? Yes. yes. We have, Mimi and I have a son who's uh, 19 and a daughter uh, 16. They're both soon to be 20 and 17 very soon. And uh, they're both artists. Our son, uh, Woodrow, 20 years old, he's the second year of college as an artist. And our daughter, Lulu, just won a really prestigious scholarship to a beautiful art school up in Napa Valley, California. And she's an artist also. As a parent, what is the most important thing you hope to have taught your children? Self-reliance. And believing in yourself. That's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, self-reliance, believing in yourself, um, confidence. Yeah. Teaching them confidence. If you could go back in life and change one thing, what would it be, and why would you do it? Oh, I would, I would uh, be, I would change my sense of confidence. I would have been more confident as a as a kid, and not listen to people that told me I couldn't do things. I probably would have been a little smarter about money. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, more uh, more confidence and um, it's hard to find confidence. It is. <clears throat> it's most people and I am and everybody is insecure, and sometimes you have to play like you're confident to be confident. So that's I think that's one of the most important qualities to have is confidence. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I probably would have just done more. I would have tried to pack more in. I would have I would have traveled more. I would have tried to meet more people. You got time, Neil. Yeah. <laughs> You're just a tyke. Yeah. Yeah. I think, okay. Um, yeah, just, I would have tried to do more. I would, I would have done a lot more stuff. Because that's one thing is no one tells you that you can just travel around the world or you can go work somewhere for a summer or you can go try this job for a while. There's many things, many, many things that are possible. Yeah. You're just going to make it happen. That's yes. Right. What has been the most memorable moment in your life? Oh, there's been many, many memorable moments. I can't really pick one. Uh, birth of our children. Yeah, I would have to say, giving birth. Pretty memorable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Pretty would, mind blowing. I would say the, my, our children, our birth of our children. Uh, I, I, I have made some pretty good memories in the last few weeks. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'll never forget what we're doing right now. So yeah, and it's this, almost like you had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes, and this experience of, of uh, having a movie made about me, about me and Mimi, and. Uh, this is incredibly memorable. We're right in the middle of a very, very incredible time for us. Uh, watching people react to the movie and being inspired by it, being interviewed by you. Uh, it's all great. What has been the most biggest challenge? Uh, money. Yeah, that's a very big reality of life. Making money and, and, get, and surviving in this culture. Because this is a, this is a, um, this is a competitive capitalist culture we live in. You've got to make money to survive. That's all there is to it, and it's a harsh reality of life. And that's the biggest challenge: is making that money. And and also as a freelancer, as people without regular jobs, and this is something we we've, we've contended with for the last thirty years. Is since both of us, you know, decided that we were going to be artists. Uh, and survive as artists was, uh, and not have regular jobs is, is the uh, crazy roller coaster of the ups and downs of our financial state. And, you know, we've been at it so long that, that uh, you know, it's, we're used to uh, lean times, but it's, it's never easy. But, you know, the other thing is... That's the trade-off, see, that we were living yeah. our dreams and Sometimes dreams are not that secure. They don't, the money isn't there. You know, it, it's it, there's an insecurity there. But that's that's you know, there's prices to pay for everything. And, but but what we've learned is like things have they are cyclical. They come around. So you know, there's there's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. You never know what's around the bend. You know, like tomorrow someone could buy a painting or some great opportunity could could pop up. You know, and you just have to keep telling yourself when you know you're like screaming down on the, the roller coaster with the no money inside. Going, ah! <laughs> that, Dreams are great, but they're also risky, and you got to be willing to take the risks. Yeah, that's that that's that was my answer. My thing is not it's it's the best and worst thing. The best thing is I don't really have a fear of of risk of blowing it all because it's really not a big deal. Like she's saying, you'll, you can get it back again. Um, <clears throat> But the hardest thing is, is taking those risks and just saying, you know what, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do this no matter what. Um, so taking risks is, is hard, but also if you can do it, it's a good, it's a good quality to have. Mr. White, in everything you've done, and all of the ways you've made what lifelong impressions on the viewers of all ages, what has been your most favorite thing you've done? Well, my favorite thing I've done commercially is Pee Wee's Playhouse, by far. That was, that was just an incredible experience. It changed television, it sort of changed the world in its own weird kind of way. And it gave me, uh, it gave me a career in television, uh, a way to uh, make money and be secure and have children and buy a house and, and, and uh, participate as a, uh, as a good citizen in the world. So Pee Wee's Playhouse is definitely my most fun thing I've done as a commercial artist. Most, and the most fun thing I've done otherwise is being a painter is, and uh, being able to uh, change my life and go into fine arts and be a painter and, and, and do my own thing. This pond and everything you've done, all of these ways you've made lifelong impressions, 
and kids of all and people of all ages. What is your most favorite thing you've done? Well, I'm working on it now. It's a graphic novel, uh, aka comic book, um, about um, as kind of a fictionalized memoir of uh, my life in Oakland after I left art school and was working in a restaurant. Um, and it's it's a, a daunting task. It's it's already. Uh, 150 pages and I'm only done with chapter two. Um, but I have a publisher and it's um, it's the, it's a story that I have wanted to tell for about 35 years. It's been inside me all this time and I um, am actively working on it and it's very gratifying and I can't wait to finish it uh, so that I can finally show it to people. But it's, you know, it's, it's just um, it's really wonderful to have that kind of project that's kind of like your life's work. So I highly recommend it. <laughs> What's your most memorable project? What's your favorite project? Uh, this one. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're looking at it. Yeah, yeah. It's making this movie. It's just three years, almost three years of my life. And now it's all coming, uh, becoming a reality and people are seeing it and, and seem to like it. So this is, this is definitely it. This is the high watermark so far. What piece of art has been the biggest impression on you? Ooh. So, well... And it can't be yours. <laughs> <laughs> As a kid, uh, Mad Magazine was a big influence on me. The artist in there, the humor, uh, the excitement of it all. That was, that was uh, a big thing for me as a kid. And I'm talking about as a kid. As I got, got older, there's a, been a string of many, many things, too, too numerous to mention. But um, I would say that and the comic books as a kid were like uh, my most memorable uh, influences. I would have to go along and say also Mad Magazine uh, is a very seminal influence. And maybe just after that, the paintings of Edward Hopper. I have many artists. I mean, I can't even name them all. I, that's a tough question when everybody asks me that because it's just, it goes on and on in my head. I can't really pick one out. It's, that's, I think that's um, part of being an artist is to gather as many influences as you can. And it, it, even just picking out Mad Magazine seems weak, but that's just one well, of many. I mean, I, in terms of just seminal, like Mad is really yeah. at the top of the heap. And, that's and, what, you know, I would study that and study that, the drawing styles and copy it. And, yeah. You know. Very early Mad Magazine. And like we said, uh, Peanuts, uh, Charlie Brown was really big when very we were big. kids. And that was a big influence on me and Mimi. Yeah. Huge influence. That's. One of the reasons we, we both became cartoonists was Charles Schultz. Yeah, movies, movies for me. I love movies. I love funny movies. I have a lot, you know, again, it's hard to make a list of one movie that you love, but I, I love watching movies. Um, I love funny movies. That's my, that's my favorite thing is to watch a funny movie. Um, so, movies funny is hard to do. <clears throat> yeah. Funny is way harder to do than drama. Yeah. It's really hard to make somebody laugh, honestly. Where do you see yourself in five years? King of the world, ma. Uh, nah. Doing what I'm doing now, being a painter, um, just keep keep working on my craft. You know, hopefully other big things will come along, but I can't anticipate those. Nope. <laughs> I can't anticipate that either. Um, but yes, I, I see myself doing exactly what I'm doing now in five years with more money. <laughs> I would say the same thing. In five years her book will be finished and, and, and hopefully she will be rich and famous from her book also. That would be nice. <laughs> but I'll keep doing it anyway. Yeah, I, I, the same, I, this, what I'm doing, I, I, it took me a long time but I finally found a, a niche and a role and, a, and a, a thing that I like to do. So I just want to keep doing this and improve on it and try to get better at it. What do I want to be most remembered for? Uh, my my own artwork, uh, I didn't. I've done, like I said, PB's Playhouse and all that stuff. That's great, but I want to be remembered for my own original artworks. I would. Right, I mean, yeah, yeah, I would say the same thing. Yeah. That and brilliant children. Yes. Yeah, I, I hope people remember me as just a good a good person, a good friend, 
someone that was there and, and kind and decent and that made good movies. Yeah. Oh, now we're gonna look totally lame next year. <laughs> Way to go, Neil. <laughs> I don't <know> kids. <laughs> yeah, no, I, that's how I'd like to be known as that I was a good friend. Well, beauty is embarrassing is a truly inspiration in so many ways. Where can may where can my viewers follow your you guys in your movie? And where else you're gonna go for the film festival? Uh, we're going to many places. We're going to Toronto next, and uh, then Boston, and then Oklahoma City, and then Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, there's a lot of strong language in the movie, uh, so that's like, you know... Colorful language. There's colorful <laughs> language in the movie, but all in all, it's a very positive movie, and, you know... Even though we do a lot of cussing, it's still <laughs> a, a message that... Uh, kids should hear. It's it's just sort of worked out that way, but if they can get past the language, it's uh, it's a great message that comes across. There's no meanness to it. It's all in fun. And beautyisembarrassing.com is the website. All the info's on there. And it's on Facebook and Twitter also. Thank you guys so much for talking with me. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. you were great. Yes. Thank you. And good job. Keep doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I have been truly enjoyed this, so thank you everyone. You're watching the Augie Network and live, laugh, love, Augie. Bye!